uh, I will now uh, introduce very briefly Professor uh, Watanabe, although he has already been uh, presented by Cecilia and by Ambassador Yamada. Uh, professor Yorizumi Watanabe is uh, Professor of International Political Economy and Dean at the School of International Communication, Kansai University of International Studies, since April 2019. He's also Emeritus Professor at Keiko University, where he taught from April 2005 to March 2019. His distinguished career has featured significant engagement in the major bilateral and multilateral trade negotiations in which Japan has been involved in the past two decades. This includes postings to Japan's diplomatic missions in Geneva from 1985 to 1990 and in Brussels from 1995 to 1998. He was Deputy Director General of the Economic Affairs Bureau, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan from 2002 to 2004. And he served as Chief Negotiator for the Japan-Mexico Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA and the Working Party on Russia's accession to the WTO. He was Special Assistant to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Japan in 2004. He's been a member of some task forces, such as the one on the Japan-European Union EPA, as well as on the Japan-India EPA, and more recently on Japan-US economic relations under Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan in 2016. Professor Watanabe actually serves on the panel of Brexit issues organized by the Japanese Federation of Economic Organizations. So, uh, as I see, Professor Watanabe is not only a very uh, in important academic on the subject, but he also has an extensive background of uh, practical experience on, on negotiations. I think it will be a real honor for all of us, uh, the Rio Branco students, from myself, uh, Cecilia, to hear from you, Professor. Please have the floor. Thank you very much for your uh, presence here. Uh, bon dia a todos. Um, that's only one thing that I could say in Portuguese. I'm sorry for that. Uh, Senor Presidente Roberto uh, Goida Nich, uh, Ministra uh, Directora Cecilia Kiku uh, Ishitani, uh, Distinguished uh, Ambassador uh, Yamada from Japan. Distinguished uh, guests, uh, distinguished students, and all the uh, excellencies here. Uh, it is a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. And uh, given this occasion, uh, extraordinary occasion to speak on uh, issues of international trade, despite the difficult period now we are all experiencing. And as you know, uh, you know the uh, epidemic uh, spread out of uh, coronavirus is a serious concern. So I might feel a little bit awkward to speak about international trade because that's the, uh, the other side of the same coin, uh, meaning uh, that you know, connectivity matters very much uh, just for the business as well as for this uh, epidemic spread out. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I would think that this is a rather temporary thing. And of course, we have to overcome those difficulties. Uh, but let's look at beyond uh, crisis beyond difficulties, uh, and with that spirit, I'd like to uh, now speak on to uh, the uh, uh, trade issues and also further strengthening the Japan-Latin America relations. So uh, today's content, uh, I'd like to, oh yes, here it is, right? Uh, yes. I can use this, excuse me for that. I think you have got all the handouts. Um, yes, so today's content is this. You see, the, uh, maybe I could uh, touch upon the, the major sources of uncertainties. Originally, I thought only two, but uh, I have to add uh, the coronavirus thing. And uh, uh, how Japan copes these uh, challenges. And um, uh, firstly, I'd like to talk about the nature and the composition of Japanese FTA policy, which is uh, described as uh, EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement. 
And uh, then I'd like to go on uh, how in practice we have been doing last couple of years. And finally, that will bring me to uh, the conclusions. So the first, uh, the major uh, concerns or the sources of uncertainties. I thought that originally, as I said, only we got to Brexit and the Trump, uh, Mr. Trump's trade policy, but now we have to think about also coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 thing. Uh, so let me start uh, with uh, the Brexit and Trump shock. And as you know, uh, this is uh, the famous picture. Uh, the Prime Minister then, back in 2016, after knowing uh, the, uh, the results of the national referendum taking place on the 23rd June 2016, and only with the 3% very tiny difference, the, those voters uh, for leaving European Union prevailed. Uh, those voters uh, preferring remaining uh, within the European Union. That was a big shock. And another shock that we got experienced uh, is this uh, Trump, uh, Mr. Trump elected as US president. And um, he praised uh, the uh, pro protectionism as a, a central part of his uh, uh, international economic policies, notably uh, in the issue of international trade. So uh, what would mean or implies uh, this uh, tendency of uh, protectionism uh, by Mr. Trump and his administration. Uh, to be more concrete, uh, there was an executive order uh, to withdraw uh, United States from the TPP. And TPP, as you know, uh, it has been under negotiation since 2010 onward. And uh, there are 11 countries uh, negotiating. And uh, actually, Japan was the last country to join back in 2013. And 2015, uh, that was in October, uh, the place was Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, United States. We got uh, the quite comprehensive. Uh, agreement and um, uh, you know when uh, uh, Madame Hillary Clinton was uh, the State Secretary of the United States, she described the TPP as a golden standard uh, of the future trade policies. Uh, but of course, during the campaign, he also joined uh, others uh, complaining about the TPP. But we all thought that once uh, Madame Hillary Clinton would be elected uh, as president, and then she will just change her mind, just uh, you know, her husband uh, did uh, with regard to the NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. But unfortunately, uh, against our all expectations, the Mr. Trump uh, got the the, um, uh, presidency, and he withdrew uh, from the TPP as his uh, first sort of uh, significant uh, uh, action to be taken. And with regard to that, for instance, late uh, veteran U.S. Senator John McCain said it was a serious mistake. And he, uh, Mr. McCain, late McCain, said that uh, that would create an opening for China to rewrite the economic rules at the expense of American workers, and it will send a troubling signal of American disengagement in the Asia-Pacific region at the time United States really uh, was needed. You see, that was his message. So uh, I think Japan also shared that kind of concern. And another thing was the uh, uh, rewriting NAFTA, and as you know, the NAFTA contains North American Free Trade Agreement, but its version two, uh, that is called the USMCA, no longer holds F. The sign F, uh, letter F is missing, free, uh, F for free. And uh, that corresponds to the quite uh, reality of this uh, uh, USMCA, because as you know, USMCA is not really free trade agreement, but it's rather managed trade agreement. So uh, quite a bit of things has been changed, even with regard to the closest allies uh, for United States, uh, that is uh, European Union and notably uh, Germany, and a uh, person like uh, Mr. Navarro as uh, accusing constantly uh, Germany as a main culprit of the uh, uh, you know, the uh, jeopardizing trade relations between uh, United States and European Union. 
So the things went on quite, uh, you know, in the wrong direction. And particularly Mr. Trump's uh, sort of tendency to deal with trade is uh, very much overwhelmed by his philosophy of bilateralism. And this bilateralism does not mean necessarily the free uh, sort of uh, trade uh, philosophy and rather uh, bilateral deals was uh, uh, more uh, dominated by the concern over uh, United States trade surplus. So consequently or accordingly, uh, China has been uh, on the uh, accused side number one, uh, followed by Mexico, Japan, and Germany, and uh, even South Korea. So uh, this reminds us of uh, uh, kind of procedural uh, protectionism that has been quite a la mode in the 1980s. And at that time, uh, you know, Japan, United States, uh, Japan, US uh, trade relations uh, was uh, in uh, quite a difficult time. And a lot of uh, um, uh, trade major uh, measures, the trade remedy measures, uh, such as uh, anti-dumping or safeguard, those have been uh, used by United States, uh, not necessarily in uh, uh, concordance with uh, Japan's side. So uh, uh, there was rather kind of unilateral sanctions imposed by United States on Japan, and that uh, what we experienced in the 1980s. And uh, at that time, uh, we all uh, noted that there was a kind of procedural protectionism based on Section 301 of US uh, trade law. So uh, uh, at that time, that was kind of unilateral sort of actions uh, that went against the principles of the GATT and the WTO. But uh, fortunately, uh, we had the Uruguay round negoci negotiations from 1986 and 1994. And on the basis of that, we got the WTO started in 1995. And uh, since then, we have got a very uh, functional uh, dispute settlement and uh, uh, under this uh, improved dispute settlement, the uh, Japan and the US, wherever we had the trade difficulties or trade frictions, uh, we, could, uh, uh, we could bring those issues to the court uh, of uh, uh, WTO, uh, namely known as panel procedures. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the whole entire US-Japan trade frictions have been uh, kept in under control. That was the situation in the, uh, in the aftermath of the, of the establishment of the WTO. Um, so um, before this uh, uh, new uh, Trump administration uh, came into power, uh, Japan and the U.S. relation was uh, being uh, quite smooth. Uh, but the problem started uh, with the, the appointment of Mr. Trump as uh, uh, U.S. president, and uh, he uh, went back to this kind of bilateralism, procedural protectionism based on uh, different uh, uh, international trade law of the United States, such as uh, even you know 1962 Trade Expansion Act. He picked up uh, Section 232, uh, which is uh, on the uh, national security concerns, uh, to deal with uh, China's um, uh, trade, uh, particularly on the issue of uh, uh, steel and aluminum. And even on cars, he, strangely enough, uh, uses this uh, uh, Section 232 of the 1962 Trade Expansion Act. And of course, uh, Section 301 of 1974, uh, United States Trade Act has been also uh, utilized to formulate uh, his uh, procedural protectionism. Uh, so that is uh, quite an issue. And the other issue that Japan is very much uh, concerned with is uh, Brexit. Brexit, is, you cannot find this word in the uh, Webster English Dictionary. This is a kind of new uh, finding. And Brexit, uh, leaving, United, uh, leaving uh, European Union uh, the, the, uh, by United Kingdom, uh, which has been unfortunately realized uh, at, on the 31st January of this year. Why Japan is so much interested in this? Because, uh, as you see, uh, many Japanese companies, starting from Toyota, Sony, Nissan, down to Nomura Holdings for services, uh, the uh, United Kingdom has been uh, quite a recipient of uh, uh, Japanese heavy investment uh, in that region. 
Uh, there are two reasons why Japan started uh, foreign direct investment in the 1980s uh, in the United Kingdom. The first reason is to mitigate the uh, U, uh, sorry, Japan UK, oh, sorry, 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 Japan EU uh, trade frictions. Uh, at that time, Japan was enjoying uh, unilaterally uh, mounting a trade surplus, both with the United States and with the European Union. And uh, one way or the other, we were obliged to mitigate uh, that kind of uh, frictions, both with the United States uh, and also European uh, Union. And uh, with European uh, Union or with the United States, uh, one of the uh, sort of uh, uh, solutions, uh, possible solution, was to increase uh, foreign direct investment entering into the United States, entering into European Union, and establishing the new factories. Uh, and uh, this is what exactly uh, they did uh, from the mid of 1980s, particularly, uh, particularly uh, Madame Thatcher, the Prime Minister of the UK then, she was very much uh, interested in having Japanese investment. So uh, she was a kind of promoter to bring you know, uh, Jap Japanese investment into UK. So you see the uh, quite uh, considerable sort of uh, uh, business activities, assemblies of uh, cars or the electric appliances uh, and so forth have been taken place. Another reason why they uh, uh, established here is that uh, they could avoid they could avoid the uh, very high uh, duty rates in, to be imposed by European Union. You know, the, uh, the duty rates on cars uh, by European Union is 10%. And for the electric appliances such as uh, uh, Prasma TV, uh, those are up to 14%. So it's quite high. Just in comparison, uh, do you know, do you have any idea of Japanese uh, duty rate? Uh, imposed on imported uh, uh, cars, say European cars, uh, any cars coming into Japan, uh, what is the percentage of duty rates? This is always quite an amusing uh, question that I enjoy very much. If you have any idea. Well, actually, to maybe to your surprise, it's 0%. It's a zero percent. So any, uh, you know, the foreign cars getting into Japan, uh, they are not subject to any uh, duties. That is to indicate that Jap Japanese government or Japan itself has no intention to protect its automotive industry through tariffs. Some complain that, uh, okay, uh, there will be no duties, but uh, there is also non-tariff barriers. Okay, that uh, kind of issue that we would like to discuss, uh, maybe with the United States, with the EU, and even with you. Uh, but uh, as, as far as uh, the uh, duties are concerned, it's zero. And actually, actually applied rates on industrial products uh, of uh, all the duties, industrial tariffs, uh, for the uh, foreign products coming into Japan, the average rate uh, is only 1.9%. So uh, Japanese tariff structure is such that uh, for in, uh, industrial imports, it's very low. But uh, to be uh, honest with you, uh, we have very high uh, protection on agriculture. But even for agriculture, the average uh, duty rates is about 12% uh, and 15%. But we have some tariff peaks, you know, the very high duties on uh, some of the uh, sensi sensitive agricultural products such as uh, rice, wheat, dairy products, meat, and so forth. So that's a matter that we have to discuss, perhaps, when we are engaged in the negotiation anyway. Um, so that, that's the, uh, the uh, Brexit. And uh, the, what would happen if uh, European Union and UK could not agree on the good terms, terms and conditions uh, to uh, you know, look after their post-Brexit situation between two countries? Um, since uh, United Kingdom has been covered by uh, common external trade policy of European Union, so uh, now they are exposed to uh, the uh, uh, very unique situation. Uh, they have to uh, be reminded that uh, they have to reinstitute the full membership of the WTO, and uh, UK should establish uh, its own national tariff schedule because so far uh, they have been covered by common external tariff for the European Union. So uh, likewise, uh, for services, they have to establish themselves uh, in regard of uh, general agreement on trade and services, GATS of the WTO. 
and also other things such as government procurement. Uh, they have to also do the same uh, to what extent the government procurement of the United Kingdom would be exposed to international competition uh, in line with uh, government procurement agreement of the uh, WTO. So, you see, this is a kind of uh, uh, the map of Japanese companies, automotive companies scattered, scattered around the uh, European Union. But as you see, the number of uh, uh, places like uh, Sunderland uh, by Nissan and also uh, Swindon by Honda and also some other places uh, for Toyota. So uh, uh, they are really in a kind of trouble, uh, you know, in terms of future investment, what to do with this, you see. So that's the, uh, the source of concern for Japanese, uh, Japanese companies uh, who, have been ex uh, who have been presented in the, in the UK. Now the third element, uh, third uh, source of concerns for us, uh, this is the most uh, recent one, and that's the coronavirus. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the global value chain of production networking has been de developed uh, to such a manner that this kind of epidemic could be also, uh, you know, take advantage of the, uh, the spread and the ch value sort of, uh, you know, worldwide uh, connectivity. So it's, it's really a pity that uh, the connectivity in a positive sense for industrial uh, outputs, industrial uh, production networking. Uh, at the same time, the uh, negative side of that, the connectivity in the virus uh, has been affecting negatively the human life. So I would say that this is a threat to human, human beings, human health, and also at the same time, it's a menace to global value chain. And uh, as you see, uh, just for your information, uh, actually, I sent the kind of updated version of uh, uh, table, but it's not reflected here. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, is the old version that I prepared for the March uh, the 3rd and March the 2nd. So uh, in the accordance with the March the 3rd, um, uh, uh, data uh, in Japan, those people who have been infected as a 274. And today I collected from uh, NHK, that's the Japanese BBC, uh, I collected the number has been increased to 480. So there's a bit of increase there for those infected. But at the same time, I'd like to also draw your attention to the number of those who passed by, the victims. Uh, although uh, we had a quite significant uh, increase of uh, number of people inf infected from 274 to 480, uh, which is the most recent number, uh, the, uh, I'd like to uh, also uh, inform you that there's only one additional uh, victim, so that makes seven instead of six uh, by now. So you see the... Uh, uh, the people affected or in infected have been increased, but uh, this toll this toll does not really uh, show us any uh, you know kind of uh, dramatic change there. So things becoming rather uh, under control. And also, uh, I'd like to mention that there are people, uh, 46 people, out of 274 recovered. Uh, from uh, coronavirus, and this recovery has been also uh, increased in number in the most recent uh, in the most recent report. So, in comparison with uh, the numbers in overseas, uh, the uh, I would say that Japan has been doing quite well in uh, in the containment of uh, uh, this uh, uh, disease, and. Since uh, uh, quite drastic, uh, drastic uh, uh, measures have been taken in Japan, such as uh, closing down, shutting down all the elementary and junior as well as senior high schools, and uh, now we are towards the end of academic year, uh, but the universities are also uh, told that 
uh, they should refrain from having uh, uh, commencement ceremonies, the graduation ceremonies, and uh, the uh, uh, government is uh, quite determined to uh, uh, tackle down this, uh, uh, saying our prime minister saying that uh, the coming uh, one week or two would be a very critical moment. So even you know the, there are some uh, small uh, fans here, the small wrestling, you know the traditional Japanese sports, uh, small is uh, now taking place without any spectators. You know usually there are about. Uh, uh, almost 15,000 uh, spectators. It depends on which uh, stadium. Uh, but the, uh, this time, uh, it's a very uh, sort of uh, unique uh, sort of uh, situation. Uh, the small wrestlers are fighting but no, no spectators. And also the uh, uh, professional uh, baseball uh, league of Japan has decided to postpone the, uh, the starting of the season. Uh, that was expected on the 20th March, but that will be also further extended. So a number of uh, very uh, significant and determined action has been taken. So I hope that uh, this uh, coronavirus thing uh, could uh, come down and uh, uh, hope that we could go beyond and the business hopefully uh, comes back. So uh, that is uh, kind of the third uh, element that I wanted to talk about and uh, again you know with the hope that uh, we could recover from that I'd like to go on the, uh, the issues of international trade uh, how Japan has been organizing uh, the international trade policies uh, maybe last uh, uh, five to uh, ten years or so. Um, the, uh, uh, the second part is uh, precisely that uh, kind of uh, uh, discussions that I want to bring in uh, to your attention. And as I said in the uh, sort of sub subtitle there, from de facto business-driven integration to a de jure institution-driven integration, um, the uh, European Union type of integration is certainly uh, de jure institution-driven integration. They set up uh, European Commission, Council of Ministers, European Parliament, and they started uh, on the basis of uh, Treaty of Rome and then uh, Single European Act in 1987, and then you have also the Maastricht Treaty of 1993 and so forth. Uh, but in East Asia, that is not the case. Uh, in, East case in East Asia, uh, it started is, uh, with the foreign direct investment, particularly from uh, Japan. And here I want to just explain the, the kind of basic sort of uh, structure uh, of uh, optimal supply system uh, in that region of East Asia. And uh, the trigger uh, was the uh, Praza Accord. Praza Accord was uh, uh, in, on uh, 22nd September 1985, and the uh, primary task of uh, that Praza Accord was uh, uh, rearrange the uh, yen to US dollar exchange rate. And at that time, just like we do now, uh, we accuse China for uh, lowering their uh, value of renminbi uh, so that uh, China could have additional uh, export uh, competitivity uh, abroad in the foreign market. Uh, the same argument has been taken place uh, in the 1970s, late 1970s and 80s that Japan has been deliberately lowering its uh, uh, value of Japanese yen in order to gain additional uh, competitiveness uh, uh, in the overseas market. So the Praza Code was the, the first major uh, exchange rate uh, realignment. And uh, uh, one dollar before, prior to Praza Code, that was uh, uh, about 225, 230 for one dollar. Then subsequent to the Praza Court, that became uh, about 180, 185 uh, per data. So roughly 25% of uh, uh, you know, increase in the value of Japanese yen. And of course, that would affect uh, negatively uh, the products made in Japan, particularly for those uh, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises who have been producing parts and components for cars or electronics. So uh, what happened after the Fraser Accord was uh, foreign direct investment. 
FDI uh, went to uh, those countries, like uh, I mentioned there, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, and Indonesia, and others. And uh, the, uh, those parts and components companies, uh, they made an enormous FDI and then started uh, their local production of those uh, you know, bits and pieces of uh, parts and components, respectively. And uh, those Japanese companies uh, took advantage of uh, uh, the uh, very uh, ambitious movement by ASEAN countries. ASEAN, meaning Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There are 10 countries now. The ASEAN nation has been promoting free trade area uh, within themselves. So uh, in order to be eligible for uh, uh, you know, zero duty treatment for those parts and components produced in the different countries crossing over to another country within ASEAN, there should be 40% of uh, values added in the respective countries of ASEAN. So if, uh, say, a Japanese company established in the uh, Philippines, uh, if they add 40% of uh, value uh, within the one product, and then this product would be eligible for getting into the other ASEAN countries. So those parts and components you know, cross over uh, the national frontiers, barrier, na national uh, frontiers, uh, national boundaries. And uh, you know, little by little, they you know, uh, increase their level of uh, uh, assemblies, uh, you know, productions. And uh, often that was a case that uh, final production uh, of car components has been done in Thailand because Thailand wanted to become Detroit of East Asia. So that was a kind of uh, uh, you know, very supportive movement by ASEAN countries. So Japanese companies took advantage of that kind of ASEAN uh, approach of freer trade, and uh, uh, this uh, production network had been uh, formulated in this way. Well, of course, Japanese companies, they are still being faced with very high duties, like in the case of Thailand, from 40 to 60 percent, or in the case of Indonesia, even higher. So in order to uh, you know, avoid those impositions of high duties, those Japanese companies wanted Japan to uh, negotiate a free trade agreement. So this way, de facto business-driven integration um, invited to uh, move on to de jure integration with the possible institutional framework uh, such as free trade agreement, but we call that economic partnership agreement. So that was the sort of background of uh, the uh, evolution of uh, Japanese trade policy, uh, starting from uh, the uh, Praza Accord and uh, uh, FDI uh, channeled into those neighboring countries. So this is a kind of summary of what I have been saying. Uh, Praza Accord as a ignition key, uh, de facto business driven integration through FDI. Uh, establishing supply chain, production networks, FDA, EPA to consolidate the merits of de facto integration uh, from bilateral FDA, EPA uh, to uh, wider uh, regional FDA, EPAs in involving ASEAN countries, ASEAN Plus uh, 3, that was uh, China's proposal uh, back in 2004. Uh, Japan could have uh, go along with this China's proposal type of ASEAN plus three, but at the same time we have a bit of uh, preoccupation that within the ASEAN plus three, China would be predominantly big. You see, maybe a little bit, you know, uh, too much, uh, you know, the uh, presence of China. Uh, so uh, what Japan proposed was in two years later, uh, in 2006, uh, Jap uh, Japan proposed uh, ASEAN plus three, that is JCK, Japan, China, Korea, plus uh, Australia, New Zealand, and India. So that is ASEAN plus six. And this ASEAN plus six became later uh, called RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So there are 10 ASEAN nations, JCK, Japan, China, Korea, that makes 13, and Australia, New Zealand, India, that in total 16. And uh, that is a quite huge market if it's uh, accomplished as, uh, as FTA.
And uh, you know, this Japanese FDA EPA policy go beyond the bilateral things, or even beyond regional one, and beyond the Asia Pacific region, uh, the TPP and also Japan EU uh, EPA have been conceived, and then we uh, fortunately, uh, you know, uh, uh, realize those two uh, major uh, EPAs as well. So uh, that is the uh, uh, market integration in uh, uh, East Asia. So we have now uh, some uh, 15 to 16 uh, bilateral EPAs, plus we have CP, TPP, uh, TPP-11 after US departure from original TPP. OK, so uh, this is uh, the list of uh, Japanese um, uh, successful conclusion of uh, EPAs, uh, starting from uh, uh, Singapore and followed by the one with Mexico. Uh, and amongst the Latin American countries, we have Chile, Peru, and Colombia down there, uh, which is still uh, sort of in lingering uh, negotiations. And that covers roughly uh, slightly more than half of Japanese external trade in total. Uh, so uh, now I'd like to take a couple of slides to explain uh, what is the component of uh, Japanese FTA, which is called EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement. Of course, the uh, uh, FTA uh, portion, you know, the uh, improving market access for goods and services is uh, always core part of our EPA, but that will be uh, complemented by other chapters within Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, government procurement, uh, competition policies, or this is the, the movement of natural persons, competition policies, and uh, uh, business environment, improving the business environment after uh, investment being taken place, and uh, bilateral cooperation, and maybe most importantly, investment. And in this investment chapter, uh, with, a, with a few exceptions, the one with Australia and the other is with uh, the Philippines, we have uh, uh, ISDS, Investor versus State Dispute Settlement, uh, that is incorporated into this chapter. We deem that element is very important. And the other more, uh, more important element in uh, investment chapter is uh, the uh, MFN, Most Favored Nation Treatment, and National Treatment before establishment of uh, any foreign company in the host country. So those are uh, uh, very uh, uh, comprehensive and also quite uh, uh, ambitious sort of package of the uh, agreement. And this is uh, more in the details of the substance of uh, Japan's EPAs. Uh, I mentioned that government procurement uh, was discussed, but unfortunately uh, here, the government procurement the, uh, from Vietnam, the Philippines, and uh, you know those countries, we couldn't bring in the uh, government procurement with those countries. But in the case of, uh, say, Vietnam and Malaysia, they are now members of TPP-11. So although we missed the opportunity to uh, uh, bring in government procurement in a, our bilateral EPA with the Philippines and Vietnam, but within the larger framework of TPP-11, since uh, both uh, Philippines, uh, sorry, uh, Malaysia and Vietnam are the members to TPP, uh, that has been covered by TPP. So it's very complementary, uh, you know, between uh, bilateral EPAs and more comprehensive uh, uh, TPP, or even in the case of our SEP. So I think uh, we have been uh, designing uh, the FTA EPA in this manner. Uh, this is the uh, composition in terms of uh, uh, you know percentage uh, for GDP and also international trade and also the membership uh, been illustrated uh, on your left hand side. 
So uh, this is uh, the uh, development of uh, you know idea of the uh, de facto and the jury integration. Uh, as you see, uh, the, some Japanese companies, uh, you know, the automotive company will export their um, highly uh, sophist sophisticated engine machineries into some other East Asian uh, ASEAN countries and uh, parts and components coming in, uh, say, uh, into Thailand. Uh, they assemble the car and uh, export them to Australia, New Zealand, or even to Japan. You know, the smallest uh, subcompact car uh, by Nissan uh, called March, Nissan March, is no longer being produced in Japan. It's produced in Thailand and uh, shipped back to Japan, you see. So it's it's uh, uh, functioning in this way. The same thing you can find also here, uh, example three. This is the uh, uh, elevator machinery. Elevator, uh, elevators lifts uh, being uh, uh, produced uh, in Thailand after assemblies of uh, principal parts and components coming from elsewhere, including Japan, and uh, exported to uh, India. So in East Asia, it's a really sort of comprehensive sort of uh, uh, production network uh, or global value chain has been uh, quite extensively uh, set up. Now, uh, how, how far we can go? I mean, the, how we should go along from now on? And uh, I'd like to explain that with this uh, slide. Uh, so from uh, left-hand side to right-hand side, um, the, we have already number of uh, EPAs, bilateral ones. And then for the East Asia, we have about 15 of them already in effect. And uh, there could be two directions. One is uh, towards East Asia. And for East Asia, we have RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, comprising 16 countries. And for the Pacific Rim, we have uh, uh, TPP-11. And uh, recently, we concluded uh, Japan-US uh, agreement on goods. So uh, we have actually two directions to move. And they are quite complementary uh, to each other, too. Because in RCEP, uh, we have uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, some, you know, the uh, less developed uh, countries uh, within ASEAN, such as Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and to some extent Vietnam. CLMV stands for Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. And uh, uh, within the framework of our SAP, uh, we could provide some uh, uh, capacity building uh, or some corporations to enhance their further development. So this is uh, the kind of philosophy of uh, inclusive growth type of uh, agreement uh, being uh, foreseen. And on the other hand, uh, for the uh, TPP, uh, that is more uh, the uh, uh, advanced countries, uh, uh, you know, sort of taste. And uh, we have uh, a very comprehensive uh, uh, regulatory, uh, uh, regulatory cooperation, uh, the uh, more rule-oriented sort of approach, and also uh, high-level uh, market access, because uh, it covers almost 99.9% uh, .9 of the goods, uh, industrial goods, and 97% uh, uh, of agriculture has been covered. So in this way, uh, you know, th those two directions, and fortunately Japan is a member to both. So Japan could play a kind of pivotal, pivotal role, uh, the bringing in, for instance, uh, uh, what we have achieved in the TPP back to our SEP and the other way around. And uh, 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 we could move on to Asia-Pacific uh, freer trade zone. We call that in APEC, free trade area of Asia-Pacific. Uh, abbreviation is FTAP. Uh, free trade area of Asia Pacific. That is the issue that we have been continuously discussing uh, within uh, the uh, 21 member economies of APEC. So this is the kind of uh, uh, forecast that I could uh, provide uh, you. Uh, 
All right, so the, uh, this is a sort of quick review of uh, TPP. As I said, uh, the very high duty elimination uh, level. Uh, even for Japan, uh, we committed about 82% of our agricultural tariff lines would be subject to uh, zero duty uh, in years to come you know, within the uh, TPP. Um, the, uh, some new rules have been also negotiated and stipulated. Uh, uh, most importantly, uh, state-owned enterprises. SOE stands for state-owned enterprises. And of course, uh, we have uh, Malaysia and we have also uh, uh, Philipp, uh, sorry, the Malaysia and Vietnam. And Vietnam is a socialist country and uh, there are a number of SOEs. So SOEs, uh, you know, uh, been uh, discussed uh, in order to cope with uh, this situation uh, in the socialist economy such as uh, Vietnam. But not only, you know, socialist economy, we have a number of SOEs in other countries like uh, Tamasek of uh, Singapore. Uh, that, and also uh, in Malaysia, there are a number of uh, Bumi Ptora related uh, national um, state owned enterprises. Uh, so you see, the uh, SOE was uh, one of the most important elements in that. But at the same time, you see, we had. Uh, in our mindset that that is to somewhat deal with China in the future, you see. The China has been always uh, kind of hidden agenda of uh, entire exercise of TPP. So, uh, uh, you know, the SOEs uh, be a quite important sort of element whenever we think about future trade relations with, uh, with China. Uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, move on. Uh, the two other elements, sorry, uh, yes. Uh, now, United States withdrew from uh, the TPP and uh, we have some uh, significant uh, sort of uh, um, backlash or the negative effect. Uh, China will take advantage of uh, US withdrawal uh, from rulemaking in trade and investment across Asia Pacific by imposing its own power oriented uh, trade policies, aggressive use of anti dumping measures, or state subsi subsidies on steel. So, you see, the United States should not have withdrawn itself from TPP. They could uh, deal with uh, China's uh, state uh, subsidies on, on steel if more effectively if they remain uh, on uh, the original TPP. Uh, China was also, China has been losing its own incentives to enhance uh, their own FTAs, RCEP and uh, JCK, in the absence of TPP, jeopardizing further trade liberalization in East Asia. Uh, that is really the uh, uh, problem. And if you look at the China-Korea uh, FTA uh, that was concluded in 2015, uh, unfortunately, uh, this doesn't really function anymore, uh, you know, because um, uh, the uh, U.S. missiles have been deployed in the, some part of, United, uh, of uh, South Korea, and uh, China didn't like that. So uh, China took uh, a number of uh, sanctions against this, and uh, unfortunately, uh, this China-Korea FTA has been, has been ruined uh, quite completely. Um, so uh, now China is more interested in Belt and Road initiatives and also uh, more strengths on the uh, China's uh, financial arms, such as AIIB, uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and also uh, BRICS Bank. Uh, so market economy principles are to be uh, irreversibly pushed back and uh, diminished, if not completely uh, faded away. Uh, so that could constitute a major crisis for free uh, democracy in that region. So that's why the, uh, Japan took a very uh, decisive uh, uh, attitude and decisive uh, steps uh, towards realizing TPP uh, even uh, without United States. So TPP minus United States, namely TPP 11, pursued as a template uh, for 21st century trade rules across Asia Pacific uh, uh, to keep momentum of liberalization uh, of trade and investment of, in that region. 
So how does Japan deal with uncertainties? Uh, TPP-11 that I have mentioned, uh, following the withdrawal of the United States, uh, Japan took initiatives uh, on, uh, you know, keep uh, the uh, um, momentum for freer trade. And this is a short chronology. And uh, uh, some 20 provisions, uh, mostly uh, in the area of intellectual property rights, uh, because th those was uh, United States who wanted to build in. So we suspended uh, those 20 provisions, but uh, no changes on the uh, market access, no uh, substantial changes in the market access deals uh, uh, in the TPP, uh, original TPP, TPP-12. And agreement in substance accordingly uh, reached in January 2018, and uh, that came into force uh, at the end of 2018. That was uh, December uh, 2018. Uh, we have a separate bilateral track uh, with the United States. Uh, we have some, uh, some prelude uh, with the United States. One is uh, our prime, Vice Prime Minister Asso and Vice President Pence. Uh, they had uh, economic dialogue since 2017. And also second step was free, fair, and reciprocal trade talks uh, since April 2018. Uh, but more significantly, we have this uh, uh, trade agreement on goods talks uh, uh, that, that had been agreed on the 26th September 2018. And uh, with the guideline that uh, the, both, min, uh, both uh, leaders set up, the President of the United States and our Prime Minister, uh, they carry on the uh, negotiations. And the negotiation initiated in April 2019, that was quite quick sort of uh, uh, negotiation, already concluded in September 2019, and that was limited only to the goods, the, therefore uh, it was, uh, uh, and also we have the TPP as a parameter of uh, the entire negotiations, so this agreement had been quickly wrapped up, uh, and that came into force uh, January the 1st of, uh, of this year. Um, as I mentioned about this uh, joint statement of September 26, 2018, uh, that was a kind of chart uh, that had been followed uh, by the negotiators from both sides. And uh, there was a, a very typical example of diplomatic paper out exercise of the differences. The uh, US president, uh, he could sell the bilateral meetings as a success in uh, persuading Japan to engage in the bilateral talks that Japan had been constantly rejecting. And uh, uh, on the part of Japanese Prime Minister, our Mr. Uh, Prime Minister Abe could uh, demonstrate uh, to the uh, domestic constituencies that uh, his government uh, position had not been changed uh, despite the strong US pressure, particularly with regard to agriculture protection. So you see, uh, this has been the uh, um, the U.S.-Japan bilateral talks, and that complemented uh, what we have reached in the TPP-11. So, all together, I mean, the, um, the, we have uh, 15 uh, bilateral one, and we have TPP-11, Japan-EU, and Japan-U.S. bilateral negotiation on goods. So, all together, uh, I think this is a kind of key uh, concept that Japanese FTA policy is to uh, multilateralize those regional endeavors. So convergence of liberalization efforts in the three mega FTAs, namely TPP, Japan, EU, and RCEP. And uh, we have been discussing the rules, of course, the, the uh, depth of the uh, uh, rules discussed or negotiated uh, differ from one another. Uh, after another, of course, TPP or Japan EU EPA, we have much deeper uh, sort of uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, rules uh, dealing with investment or uh, you know the intellectual properties, competition policy, and so forth. While with RCEP countries, RCEP uh, a little bit remaining in the shallow sort of degree of uh, uh, of rules, uh, but nevertheless, uh, those um, you know the results of the. Uh, uh, mega FTAs can be uh, brought back to uh, the WTO. 
a new momentum uh, to reinforce trade multilateralism. Therefore, the uh, rule making in the digital trade, cooperation in the WTO reform discussions, uh, we could emerge a new sort of momentum uh, for that purpose. Japan and Mercosur countries, I think, in that light, uh, should work together to strengthen the WTO system. I, I'm sure that there will be uh, quite clear um, understanding as well as uh, uh, consentment. And Mercosur countries, uh, at the end here, Mercosur countries constitute uh, for us a last remaining piece of jigsaw puzzle. So we like to fill in that uh, jigsaw. So, um, you know, this is a kind of uh, the picture that I'd like to share with you. We have uh, uh, three mega regions, uh, you know, the uh, Europe, Americas, and East Asia. And between uh, East Asia and Americas, and particularly the Pacific Rim countries, we have APEC. Now from APEC, we have TPP, or US-Japan. Uh, we have between EU and East Asia, we have uh, Japan EU uh, EPA uh, stemming out from ASEM, Asia Europe meeting. Uh, EU and uh, uh, NAFTA uh, still sort of suspended, but uh, there has been a TTIP. So, uh, fortunately, uh, those mega regions are connected. Uh, with those uh, mega uh, framework of freer trade. And from Japanese perspective, we have RCEP for East Asia, we have TPP and US-Japan, we have Japan-EU. So, uh, you know, we'd like to move on uh, like this. And uh, uh, here, I would like to uh, stress that, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, Mercosur, uh, which is really, uh, uh, so far, uh, nothing really uh, took place. And uh, this is the area that we like to work on. I mean, the, uh, this kind of sentiment has been shared also by Japanese business communities such as uh, Kei Dan Ren. So concluding remarks, uh, this is the very end of my uh, uh, speech this morning. Uh, TPP-12 as a temperate uh, for 21st century type uh, trade agreements. And uh, uh, TPP-11, CPTPP, uh, Comprehensive and uh, Progressive TPP, to keep momentum for freer trade in the region of Asia Pacific. And RCEP JCK for updating the production network or GVC, global value chain in East Asia. And Japan EU EPA, that's a major uh, interregional mega FTA connecting East Asia and Europe uh, via Japan. Japan Mercosur EPA uh, to be further explored as a subsequent policy agenda. And I would think that a joint study group uh, to, be uh, to be comprised of three sectors, namely private sector, administration, and academia uh, to be uh, established uh, to scrutinize, uh, to discuss the merits and demerits uh, of such endeavor. And all these uh, to bring us to the position uh, whereby we could maintain and strengthen trade multilateralism embodied in the WTO, and uh, thus to enhance further predictability in the international business. And that is uh, the end of my speech this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.